Tonight, at interview with a warrior, we receive uh, Mr. Dennis Mahoney from the Toshindo organization, Shinobi Science Branch. He will be uh, in Quebec in August uh, to give a seminar, and this is why we receive him, to talk about his art, his view on martial art, his personal journey in uh, ninjutsu, and it was really a blast, really interesting. I hope you guys will enjoy the podcast as much as we enjoy it and uh that's it jay and if you guys uh, like what we do make sure to uh, hit the, the like button and uh, to share it and if you like what we do just go see our channel we have a uh, other interview in english and we have a big channel in french so if you like it just like share and uh, tell it to your friend Cicatrice nous rappelle d'où on arrive Les combos qu'on doit livrer quand le destin chavire Guerrier, on fera ce qu'il faut pour la famille Cœur de lion, œil de tigre, on a la paix dans la mire The battles are never ending, I know But we will get up and get on with the fight And we'll do whatever for what is right Just put your trust in us and us So tonight at Interview with a Warrior uh, We are back with uh i don't know how to say it uh some kind of a legend or some kind <laughs> of an institution <laughs> kev gonna be uh, able to introduce him uh, better than me uh it's uh dennis mahoney uh so kev i'll let you introduce him properly and we uh continue oh from thank there. you um yeah so mr mahoney is uh my teacher actually so um not gonna lie here uh we first met like in 2011 i think at a uh a seminar in portland maine and now i've seen him move and i'm like wow this this is mesmerizing and i want to learn to move like this so i just went to him and asked him what's step one to do what you are doing he said <laughs> well Here's the step one, mm. and we proceed to do with one of my um, with one of my students and now uh, teacher in, in the dojo as well, Jason. We proceed to do two hours of only step one. While Dennis was teaching somewhere something totally different, we were just doing step one with a knife. So uh, this is how our relationship with Mr. Maoni began uh, together. So, uh, yeah. So, Mr. Yeah. Maoni is a member uh, of the Shiankai, which is the close guard of Mr. Stephen A's in Toshindo. Um, he's always, he's a hate done in Toshindo, like six done in Bujinkan. He's got his Shidoshi license. So, he's been around it for like more than uh, almost 40 years. So, uh, yeah, that's my teacher, Mr. Dennis Mahoney. Yeah. So, Mr. Hey, Mahoney, please, Dennis. maybe, maybe we, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. So, Dennis, where maybe we can, we can start like every other of our guests. Tell us where do you come from and where did you begin martial arts? I, uh, not when, because we learn, learn it already, but where and why um, did you, so begin now I'm in New arts? Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, where our dojo is mm -hmm. originally i was in uh boston and massachusetts and i played uh, football in college american football and i got a mm -hmm. knee sir i had a knee injury got surgery and after the surgery wanted to get some flexibility i think this is like 1983 at this point uh took up kempo karate and was doing that for i don't know I think three or four years, and I found Stephen Hayes' books. Got into reading Stephen Hayes' books because it was the 80s. He was everywhere. Um, he was on every magazine all the time, all those books. And then uh, in 1988, I found Mark Davis, who is uh, the head of New England NIMPO and Boston Martial Arts Center. And he started, he is one of Mr. Hayes' personal students from 1982. He's been with them since the beginning. I think 80 or 81, Dr. Hatsumi came over. Mr. Hayes introduced him to the world and then Mark found him in 82 and he's been doing it ever since. And then, uh, by the courtesy of Mark, I got to meet and get beat up by every great martial artist in ninjutsu. Uh, he introduced me to everybody and I was, 
I was that idiot 25 year old back then going, really, you can knock me out just by hitting me in the arm. Let me see, you know, get knocked out. That was that, I was that guy, you know, it's like, prove it. Let me see. So I punched in for everybody. I mean, he, Dr. Hatsumi, Stephen Hayes, Rumiko Hayes, all the senior Japanese, their own, uh, Moti Natif in Israel. That guy was fantastic. Beat the hell out of me for two days at a seminar. It was just, it was just amazing. He introduced me to all these amazing people. And, uh, it was, it was great because I was a bouncer during college and things in the bar didn't always go down like they said in the dojo, you know, it's like the 400 pound Russian who hugged me and my feet came off the ground, you know, and I'm six two, almost 300 pounds. And he just kind of gave me a little hug, took me off the ground, you know, the, the knives, the bottles, all that stuff. And then uh, I met Mark. And he introduced me to an entire world of martial arts magic where I got to play around with things that seem like magic were uh, avoiding and getting out of the way and having people fall down just because they missed you. And uh, it's been, well, it's 88. So what are we looking at now? 34 years. Yeah. 34 years. And uh, up right up until the pandemic, we, I was still every week going down to see my teacher in Boston. I consider myself the luckiest guy in ninjutsu. I've got Dr. Hatsumi is the head of the whole thing. Stephen Hayes was one of his first students. Mark Davis was one of Stephen Hayes' first students, and I was around when Mark started teaching. So it's like this great time period. And I, I, I call it the, uh, the years before the teacher goes, ooh, maybe we shouldn't teach that publicly. Um, you know, so... Stephen was there for Dr. Hatsumi going, oh, wait a minute, maybe we should. And then Mark was around when Stephen went, maybe we shouldn't teach that anymore. Mark. Luckily, I was around before Mark decided that too. So it's just, uh, it's been it's been amazing. It's been a wild trip. So we're going to get back later to the, maybe we yeah, shouldn't yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure, teach sure. that uh, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. And uh, what what do you do for a living now? Are you teaching uh, full time? Yeah, yeah no, I, I was um, side. I was in sales for a long time in different uh, businesses, but then uh, we got into doing this, and it, it's it's worked out. We created the uh, um, now we have a dojo that's part of Toshin Do, part of the Budokan, and we're doing what we call Shinobi Science, which is uh, uh, kind of a training method. Mm -hmm. It's not really we're, we're not forcing any curriculum on one person. It's just a, uh, it's a way of learning that we use that's based on um, the research we did into how people learn and the different sciences that match up with the ninjutsu martial arts. So. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, would you say that is the difference between like the core Bujin Khan and the Toshindo way, because we talk with people from Bujin Khan, maybe other branches, mm -hmm. you know, and we talk with Kevin a lot of time about Toshindo. So in your words, what, what would be the, the bigger difference or the, the specifics of the Toshindo? Well, uh, I mean, I, I've been doing, honestly, I've been doing Bujin Khan longer. So it's, it's, it, to me, um, There's 400,000 people in the Bujinkan, supposedly. That was the last number. So you get the bell curve, you know? There's an entire bell curve of everything's a bell curve in life. There's people at the top of the average, and then there's people on either side. So when you talk to people about what's the difference in the Bujinkan, the Bujinkan, you got nine traditional systems that you would have learned just one growing up or maybe two, you don't learn nine. The person, Takamatsu Sensei, who brought them all together was just one of these, you know, mythic people who was in the right place with his family because he had relatives. So by the time he was 14, he had three of the schools and on, you know, it's just this mythic person that brought together so much information. So when you look at the Bujinkan, you got all these different people out there and they, some of them specialize in one school or the other. Some of them specialize in, I really want to look at the classical historical swords or the history. Um, some of them 
just look at the taijutsu depending on you know where their line is some of them get into uh i don't want to say mysticism but the mind sciences want to get into understanding that because it's so broad there's so much information the fact that it's really too difficult for one person to see it all and uh Dr. Hatsumi, I don't think, was trying to get it to any one person. He just wanted to get it out there. Uh, actually got a, a quick story. Jack Hoban uh, was telling a story one time about him being on stage with Hatsumi Sensei at a Taikai. And no one was getting the technique. He was having people come up and no one was getting it. And finally, Jack goes, oh, I think I got it. And he went up back up on stage, did it. And Hatsumi said, yes, Dad, go do it. And, of course, everyone went and tried. No one was getting it still. Hatsumi moved on. And Jack went up to Hatsumi Sensei and said, Sensei, they're not getting it. He goes, yeah, but you got it. And Jack was like, oh, my God. He's not trying to get one person to know everything. He just wants everything to be known. You know, So if you're not there in the right place at the right time or you don't have people that you trust, it's going to look different in the Bujinkan. Now, the Toshin Do, Mr. Hayes was there in the beginning. It, Stephen was there, Rumiko, Rumiko, his wife, Mrs. Hayes was there. You know, they're one of the original, I think, I think there was like 18 or something at that time, 18 or 20 people, maybe four, somewhere in there. So it was in the teens of people that were training with Hatsumi Sensei at that time. So they got all this information too. And then what Mr. Hayes wanted to do is he came back and he looked at middle America and he said, you know what, not everybody wants to be able to put claws on and climb up the wall. He goes, some people just want to learn how to defend themselves or, you know, get a little bit more self-confidence and something like that. It didn't have, you know, it, it's actually funny. He's got a story where he and I had an interesting uh, term when he first came to us in 86 to say he was going to do Toshin Do. He was like, uh, you know, there's the working with the guys that are Navy SEALs or military people on one side or just working with the, you know, the, the housewife in the middle of America. And uh, he goes, I want to work. He goes, I want to work with the housewife now. And I went, yeah, I want to work with this guy over here for now. And, you know, that was 86. By, you know, 2000, 20 years later, I came back and, you know, joined them again because just helping the general public. I mean, I'm in Derry, uh, in Plastown, New Hampshire. It is not exactly a metropolis, you know, it's just everyday people coming in that want to learn. So you're not going to get the people that we got back in the old days. In the old days of the Bujinkan, you had to travel to get it. You couldn't go to a school. You had to go chase it and find, try to find legitimate people. And there were a lot of people that were not, I mean, there were people making up stuff and doing stuff and, Hey, whatever they want to do, I'm open to everybody. So the biggest difference now is you've got the Bujikan where these people are going and you've got these nine giant schools with this historical material that's done a specific way. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to ask why is it done that way so that you can apply it to your modern culture. Yeah, it, because was, back in the 90s, it was probably mm -hmm. done... At that way, at that time, based on their realities of their historic. Well, yeah, realities. it was based on what they were wearing, what weapons they were carrying, what the situation was, what the problem was. Mm -hmm. That was what that answer was derived for. That may not be the situation now. Obviously, it's not. We have much different situations now. Okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the historical stances you see in the Bujikan where they're very low. They were for a specific thing, they taught you something. But if you were to try to do that now, that was for mud in a battlefield, wearing armor, carrying a you know a naginata that weighs 20 pounds. You don't want to do that against a grappler now with your legs sticking out that far because they're just going to grab it and take you down. So if you're asking why does something work, then you can learn to apply it. Well, this is what Mr. Hayes did. He took his knowledge of the historical material and he made it palatable for the... Uh, general public to understand. Vantage I had was Mark Davis was always doing that. We were in Boston in the 90s, and uh, it was not the safest place to be in the 90s. Um, and Mark was always, we would take a historical technique and go, okay, this is what it does. This is why they did it. What would that look like today? 
So instead of a, a long sword coming in a big lunge, it's a flip knife coming out of the back pocket and going in fast. And how do you deal with it? And we just applied in the same way. So for me, the difference wasn't between Bujikan and Toshin Do is it's just a, it's a scale of there's these skills and they're in a certain model. Is it, are you looking at a historical model or are you looking at a present day model? It doesn't matter which model you use if you're coming down to answer why does that work if that's what your goal is. If you want to do something historical, then do Bujikan, you know? I mean, we have that material in Toshin Do because Mr. Hayes has it all. Um, it's, you know, it's just those Akata models of how to do things. That's all. So there's like one modern, modern and one the other like more traditional, we could say. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's just the idea of going... Um, what are you going to run into today versus what did you run into in 14th century Japan? Okay. But that doesn't, yeah, but, it's just a good, just a natural evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Things, it, right? it, but with this, it was more of like, it doesn't say that the 14th century is wrong. If you know why that person did that, if you're just trying to mimic it and you know, Oh, look, he did this big thing with the armor and this big thing and then try to apply that today. No, it's not going to work. If you understand how that person's balance is broken, how they get out of the way, then it can be applied today. That's what it, it is. Mr. Hayes just did it for people. Some of us were already doing it in the training. Mr. Hayes put it together in Toshin Do and made it, it made it more referenceable. I mean, when I first started, the, the historical stances to me, I mean, I was a 25-year-old American football player. This stuff was like, what the hell is this? You know, I mean, it was this crazy-looking stuff, and we were not built to do it. I mean, my teacher's 6'4", I'm 6'2". Most Japanese are not. And, you know, they wanted us with our knees down parallel to the ground. It was not easy, you know. <laughs> and then we realized, oh, they were doing it to get us in shape. They didn't actually fight like that. I get to see senior Japanese kind of go at it in a little, what we would call sparring. They call randori. Get to see them go at it. They're not down there in those big flat stances. They're moving around like a real fight. And also Asian and West West uh, or North American like us, Westerners like us, we, are, we don't have the same flexibility, the same physical specs from other regions on the planet. So you have to adapt what you teach to the people you are teaching it's, to, it, right? It, that, that, that's exactly right. In fact, there's um, there's a big mistake that we were all making in the 80s and 90s. We were trying to turn our feet out as far as the Japanese were into these wide stances. And we can't physically do it. We it just can't physically do it. If you just keep your foot under your hip, drop your hip back, you're fine. It lines up and it works the exact same way because it's based on your physicality. And it's funny you say that. What you just said, Dr. Hatsumi said, I was at a Taikai in the 90s and he actually, there was a group of people that had just passed the sword test and he told them that it's your job now to go back to your culture and present the ideas how that culture understands them. He didn't want us to all be him. He wanted us to take the ideas and share it with our people. And that's why, you know, my teacher has been, uh, he's just, he's, he's amazing, but a very realist. You know, he wants to make sure here's the art, but here's how it works. And then we came up with Shinobi science because we're not Japanese. Uh, people run around and go, okay, this Japanese word means this. No, it don't. Uh, you know, it's like people will say, Just the word kamai, which is our word for stances. People are like, well, the, the kamai means this. Well, Mrs. Hayes, who is Japanese, finally translated it for us. And the words actually mean like a wooden fence opening and closing that can change shapes. Right. And after 30 years of training, that made sense to me. But if I got somebody walking in the door, I go, okay, you're going to get into kamai. I got one guy, he thinks there's an R in it. He keeps saying, I'm going to get in Karmai. And I'm like, no, you're not getting into Karmai. Don't worry about it. You're just going to get into a shape. So we started using English words. And then, you know, I got to deal with Kevin, who's yelling at me in French, and my French is terrible. <laughs> so, 
we came up, we wanted okay. to find universal words. So science was the easiest way mm -hmm. to do it. We could go to, we could get physics references. We could get neurological references and stuff like that and say, okay, now try these experiments. And it didn't matter what language you were speaking. So that's why we came up with this to do it this way so that we can, I can give him a set of experiments, not mm -hmm. getting punched in the face is the language. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I'd like to do that too, but you, know, you guys have met Kevin. So you, you probably sympathize with me. Um, so. <laughs> Thanks. But he can then go and get, do the experiment. And when he gives me the results, it shows me where he's at. It tells me so I can make adjustments. But when he gets the answer right, he's discovered it. He owns it. It's not me telling him a set of things that he has to memorize. So that's why we mm -hmm. went and moved on to this method. Interesting. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, and, really. And uh, all the, the things that we cannot teach anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. forget. I had a Let's question back to this. about that. <laughs> you know, us, we, we learned that we have some defense too. And some are like much, um, how can I say it? Like you kill the guy like so many times, can you even like know how many times he's dead by the time he touched the ground? Yeah, exactly. OP. And so we don't teach them like right away, but if people wait long enough and you know, they, they keep in and they, they keep doing some classes and you know they become senpai, sensei and close guard, like they, they become like, they know those, these stuff because they become like, a, like, you know, become part of the dojo. Yeah, exactly. Old -timer. So does yeah. that. Uh, can it happen in your style? Like if someone stay around for a long time, can you learn the old stuff or like uh, it's yeah, really something yeah. that you don't show it anymore? It's no, no, we no. I, I see this is where I wanted to get to. This is really why I created Shinobi Science. And for our dojo, um, like we have an online version where people like Kevin are training with us either, you know, via Zoom or something. And then we have all the recording stuff. But for people that want to come into the train with the dojo now, I make them fill out an application uh, and I interview them because we're showing that stuff now. I mean, there's, you still got to do a lot of work, but it's it, it's less that it's like, you know, the stuff you don't want to show anymore. There's rules. I mean, oh, so we live in a, well, there's, there's, we live in a society that if you actually defend yourself, you could be sued or arrested for defending yourself. Okay. Um, so teaching the guy that just walked in the door and he's two weeks in how to have somebody trip fall and have the knife go up into his throat and cut across this way and probably not the best idea to start with, you know? Uh, so it was these ideas and you'll, you'll see like, um, if you've done any jujitsu or seen any jujitsu or judo, a lot of the throws that you see in those arts, um, have older versions Mm. Uh, in Japanese Yeah, Japanese, the older versions, there was no ukemi. Mm. There's no rolling out of it. There's no flipping. There's no slapping out. Um, they weren't... See, yeah, right yeah. They're head. landing on their head. You're hopping back four inches so that the elbow's snapping on the way down. Um, you know, you're dropping and the knife or the foot or the toes coming up at the same time to meet them halfway there. You're dropping and onto one knee and their face is hitting you know, the knee, this is all these really, it's so people are in class going, yeah, yeah, you got this throw and there, just step there. And then, like you said, they stay around long enough. It's like, yeah, don't step there, nail and watch where the person's head lands. Just go really slow. Oh, it just hit my knee. So yeah, it's these types of things that you just don't, it would be, uh, it would be reckless just to throw it out there. You know? Yeah. At some point um, you, want to make sure and i'm always making sure when i'm showing that stuff is are you ready to live with the consequences of what you just did you just right. changed yeah. possibly a guy's life because you just wrecked his knee or you just right. uh disfigured him so are you ready to face the consequences is this really what you want the only thing you want to learn or do you want to learn a maybe a safer way just to be able to defend yourself and yeah. be able to deal with this guy without changing his life forever. So that's the pendulum that we are always dealing with, I think. But you know, it's interesting that you say that, Kev, because I used to say to my adult uh, women student, 
you know, if you hypothetically live with uh, domestic violence, right, and your husband is beating you to a pulp, uh, you know what? I know that you're going to get sued if you defend yourself. But personally, I prefer to go to your trial, uh, to uh, either to your funeral, right? I, I prefer your trial to your funeral. I don't want to see you dead. So we, we figure out the problem later because he's beating you every day. You have to defend yourself if it happens, right? So like you said, Dennis, the society right now is putting us in a situation where we teach methods to defend ourselves, but we have to tell the students, you know, you have to be smart with this because you're going to get in trouble no, but no matter what you did. And I teach techniques to ch children in karate class, in Kenpo class, that I have to say, you know, this one, you cannot apply it at school. So this is a school right. version. So this is a soft version but, that you know you can do this in school. You you may have trouble, but not too much. You know, he's not gonna get hurt so bad, but he's gonna leave you alone, and your parents gonna sign a paper. And you know what? If your parent don't want you don't want to sign the paper because you defend yourself, they would not bring you to me, right? Uh, so your parents know that yeah. you're gonna learn some stuff. But of course, we have to tell them. That yes. you have to be smart but with this. It is a slippery subject because, you know, like if you take um, mm -hmm. every time you have confrontation and some when you have to react, if you take a police officer, like each time, now they have body cam so we can see what they do. They have a weapon, you know, like and, and even them, when they do something, people complain. So it's really hard to tell to our student, like, Yes, they train for that, but it's not their job. And, you know, like, sometimes it's just for fun or whatever. So it's really hard to, like... Because even people who it's their job to do this make mistakes. So it's really hard for us to, to, to tell our student how to gauge it, right? But I think it's it's kind of, like... That's why I say it's a slippery subject, you know? Yeah, it, the, those situations are extremely difficult, domestic violence situations, because there's so much going on to them. Because the actual physical violence is such a small percentage of what the women have to go through. They're going through mental abuse. They're going through verbal abuse. Uh, sometimes it's financial ab abuse and control. They're being, they're, they're being controlled in many ways. So it's, it's very hard. Like I, I, you know, at, to me that it, that's, you're taking the point of like a good man. You don't want it to happen to them. You just want them to be safe. Uh, it's just, it's such a difficult thing for us to put ourselves into because We, we do that. Our, uh, Kevin knows my business partner, Teresa. We have a women's program that's based on ninjutsu about escaping. And we try to teach women how to escape uh, and get away. Um, and this goes back to what you were just saying about the slippery slope. We treat our techniques, that whole idea of you know, stuff we're supposed to be like, like a real weapon, a knife or a gun. Ready, willing, and able. Is it readily available? Have you practiced it enough? Is the you know if you've got a gun and it's not on the holster, it's not available. Are you willing to take the consequences, like you just said, to deal with it? And are you able to do so in a real fight when somebody's going to be trying to take that weapon away from you? So there's that those three levels. But in ninjutsu, our goal isn't to win. Our goal is to survive and get away. So it gives options. There's no dishonor to us to running and hiding. We have an entire system of learning how to hide and disappear in shadows and trees and shrubberies. I mean, there's, you know, the classical ninja mythology you guys have all heard about guys disappearing. There's science to it on how to disappear. So to us, it's not a dishonor to disappear. If I get those people out of there, we We, you know, we fake like we're injured and then all of a sudden the person's getting arrested because I fell down and they went through a table and, oh, man, I hurt my elbow when I fell down. I'm getting old. That guy pushed me. I'm, I'm really sorry he hit the table as he flipped, you know. It all looks like an accident, you know. We, we don't have to win. And when you don't have to win, you have options that uh, that are different than the competitor, Right. And, and, and I'm not putting competition down. I loved that stuff when I was younger. I mean, I'm just getting too old for that crap, okay? But that stuff was a blast. Uh, you know, it was, it, I, uh, 
I was terrible at point sparring because I didn't, you know, I came from a bouncer mentality. I didn't know you actually weren't supposed to hit them. And I kept hitting people and knocking them out of the ring. And they're like, penalty. And I'm like, but I hit him. I don't get it. You know, I was just really not too good at it. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, th- that stuff's great. And I love grappling on the ground. Uh, we were doing that before the Gracies showed up in the early 90s. Um, and we were getting picked on. It was funny because we were getting picked on for it. Back then in the 90s, when we were going to the ground and locking people up, people were like, well, we don't fall down. And then the Gracies showed up and everyone then went to the ground. And now it's like, you guys want it both ways. Yeah, we, we've been doing all this stuff and it's a blast. But as big as I am, I don't want to take on a 25, 30 year old big guy on the idea that yeah, I, can, I know how to fight. I can beat him. No, I'm, he's going to trip. He's going to miss me. He's going to punch a wall. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to confuse him and make him lose his balance and find humor in the moment instead of trying to be this, you know, all-powerful weapon. My all-powerful weapon is humor and comedy. I like to make people think, like, oh, did you just fall down? Are you okay? You know, And this is why this stuff is so magic for actual women. I mean, I've seen Teresa, I've seen Mrs. A's wreck the crap out of you. Yeah, Yeah, and this is totally, and now uh, with the experience, I am, sorry, Dennis, but I'm more impressed with uh, Teresa and Mrs. A's moving than a big tall dude doing stuff but well, what, she's, what's impressive she's literally she mrs hayes is literally one third of my size we did the math one day I said, <laughs> how much do you weigh she goes she's an ass i said i just want to know and she said and then i went oh my god i'm three times your weight and this is as i was flying through the air crashing on the ground the woman beats the crap out of me she's awesome but She's a third my size. And that's not because mm-hmm. she's overpowering me. It's because every time I go to hit her, I miss. I'm off balance, and then something else is trapped, and I'm losing. I collapse in on myself. She lets me defeat myself. And unfortunately, Teresa took 10 years of privates with her, so now Teresa does it <laughs> to me, too. So, And it's funny because we talk a lot, uh, a lot of time with Kevin and other other guests about the differences between uh, uh, fighting sports and real self defense in real life situation, mm-hmm. and all the tricks that you can use in real life situation with death threat situation that you cannot use in a cage. Even in MMA, they have rules. Even if if they can do a lot of things, they can mix a lot of styles. But there's a lot of little things that they cannot do. And right now, MME is the thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, BG, BGG is the thing. And it may give the impression to some people that, you know, I know how to fight in a cage. I'll know how to defend myself in the street, which is really not the same thing. Even though getting punched and being able to stay up is a good yeah. ability, okay? But but uh, the fundamental I mean, skills of self defense. Yeah, the fundamental skills are similar. Yeah. But the situation yeah, is never the course. same because this is the problem. Mm-hmm. If you're doing a sports competition, you know when, where, who, you know, you're training for it, and the person in front of you is pretty evenly matched because otherwise it's not a good sporting event, right? It'd be boring if it was just you know. Somebody kicked one person's ass, although it's funny, but you know, it'd be boring, right? So they're pretty evenly matched, right? And we do this intentionally, so now you can see who's the better athlete, right? Okay, well, the, the, the women I have in the dojo don't care who the better athlete is. They just want to make sure when the boss at work decides to get a little bit more touchy than he should – that they can get away. Um, you never know. That's the problem. That I, I can't tell people. So our answers can never be when A happens, do B so you do C. It's never like that for us in a self-defense situation because there's too many possibilities. And 
is the person bigger? Is they small? That are they got a weapon? Are the, is there two of them? Is there three of them? The, the 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 endless possibilities get to be too much. It drives my friends crazy. The, my friends that don't do martial arts, like, well, what would you do in this situation? I don't know. And they're like, well, how can you not know? You've been training for forty years. I uh, well. Tell me, you know, when I get to the situation, I'll tell you, is it raining? Is it slippery? Are there chairs? Is there a car? Is there a camera? Uh, <laughs> are people watching? Are people not watching? Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Witness or not witness. Um, <laughs> you know, those variables are all too much. It has to be in the moment. So that's why, again, we went back to a science idea. Instead of set answers, there are principles. Ideas that can be applied to every situation. So now you go back to the Bujinkan. There aren't a lot of people running around in Kuki Shindenru armor anymore. Uh, and I say not a lot because we there are some crazy... I mean, there was a guy... We said this one year and some guy on the New York subway came up with a samurai sword and attacked somebody. So I, just, there aren't a lot. You know, it's not, it's not zero, but there, are, yeah. <laughs> but there aren't a lot of them, right? But what the... Why did they do the things they did? Because if you look at that stuff, the armor was really heavy. You look at grappling with it. Oh, that's really good against a bigger person if you understand how they were off balancing each other to get the armor to go, right? Versus one of the other schools that was uh, uh, more of a um, uh, almost a police force. This Takagi Yoshinru one it has a lot of locks in it because they were kind of like samurai cops. Not they were, There wasn't any cops, but they were the guards. So if anything was going down, they had to subdue it. So you have this system that folds people in on itself. Well, how does that work? Why does that work? And how can I apply it today? That's what we look for. So this it's like, is it Bujikan or is it Toshindo? Well, if you go back to the Bujikan, you get to go back to the source. But then you got to do a lot, a lot of work if you really want to claim that you know what you're doing. You can't, you know, I don't claim to teach Bujinkan techniques. I study Bujinkan techniques and share them with my students via Shinobi Science. I would never say, this is how it's done. I go, this is what I have found. Not, this is how it's done. I'm, my ego isn't that big. And I got a big ego. Okay. And it's not, but it's not that big. Okay. But you take that. Toshin Do, Mr. Hayes did that work for people. He was like, I'm going to take out the principles from the ancient stuff. I'm going to stick it in modern examples for you to make it easier to see. That's what he did. He made it easier to see. Um, and he applied it to what was there. You know, also, he was in the, in the and we get this crap all that we, from the years. The Bujikan were always doing these big step through straight punches, right? And everyone's like, no one punches like that. Except for Tyson, yeah, but uh, <laughs> he actually does. Tyson does a big step through punch when he wants to finish somebody off. Uh, he's kind of good at it. But what they didn't understand is the Japanese were literally going, "No, this is the model." Okay, it's just the model. This thing's coming at you this way. Then there's this safe space. There's this dangerous space. That's all they were showing. I mean, even the throws, when they first came to America, the throws are supposed to be done in tight in this person's space. But when they first showed it to all of us, it was like, step here, do a big step across, and then do it. And we're like, why did you show it us that way back in the 80s? It's like, you're all too weak. Your legs weren't strong enough to get in there and do it right. Like, oh, okay. I I I'm cool with that. I mean, they were just being good teachers but if you don't keep training, you go, well, my teacher showed me this, and that's the way it's supposed to be done. Your teacher was showing you a drill because that's all you could handle at the time. Grow up. Keep training. It never ends, you know? Mm. So true. So true. And for people who, who are not doing martial arts or for the people who are doing, like, Sport, uh, fighting sports and when they come to a dojo of martial arts they often the reaction will be like it's not realistic this is not how it's going to be in the cage or something but this is not we, what we told to our students too but like Kev already experienced with someone you know this is a b bullshit or something like that from someone you know we heard that a lot because they don't know 
that it's the step one and eventually you're going to be better. You understand the principle, like you said, and you're going to be able to apply it realistically because you master the concept yep. of it. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of pe people yeah. cannot see the bigger picture and it's, it's usually mm -hmm. the same people Then when you want to show them like some tricks of self-defense, they're like, oh no, don't touch me. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, because... Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's easy to take a technique out of its context and uh. just put it and mm. do something totally funny with it uh, it's it well it happens all the times with what we are showing so uh, well, but see, okay so mm -hmm. you guys are you're all saying the same thing i really like because if you're doing a sport fighting okay um mark had us learn how to box when we first started okay and then we morphed it into ninjutsu boxing so we were still using our taijutsu to do the same thing but if if we're in a ring with gloves on it's okay to turn my head, take a shot so I can get to his body, to let it skim off me, to hit me. It's okay. It's, it's a tactic. It's like let him think he's got you. Give him the rib and come over the top. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but ninjutsu grew up in a time frame when everybody had sharp pointy things. Everything was sharp. It was a knife. It was a blade. It was a dagger. There was always sharp things. And it's, um, I actually got to wrestle. You guys know, um, Dan Severin, the beast. Remember, you remember Dan Severin, the beast from like EFC five. That's how old I am. Okay. It was, <laughs> he, he, I think he won EFC five. Okay. Um, Dan, he, I stood next to Dan. He's about the same height as I am. Okay. But we look like a perfect square next to each other because I'm kind of triangle this way and he's kind of triangle the other way. So together we were just this big block of body. And he on the ground is like Mr. Hayes standing up. This guy is just one of the best th there is. And he was in town and I got to wrestle with him. He, they had some judo and jiu-jitsu people. And uh, my friend Daryl invited me over. So I'm, I go, look, man, I don't play. I don't know your sport, but I'll, I'll go. And we're rolling around. And uh, I did something, and I had his arm locked up, and I didn't commit to it. And he goes, hey, hey, you've got it. If you just go a little further, you could lock my, lock my arm up. I said, yeah, but your other hand can get to me. He goes, yeah, but you just put your chin down. He goes, so they hit the hard part of your head, and you can lock the guy's out, arm out and submit. And I'm like, I completely understand, sir, but my teacher would be sticking a knife in my ear. And this guy who was this master at doing this stuff went, wow, that would change everything. He was completely cool with it. He was a real martial artist because, like you said, some people, Jay, like you said, some people don't want to hear it. He was completely open to it. He was one of the best there is at his stuff. And he went, yeah, that would change everything. You know, and I was like, all right, I got respect for this guy because he just left his mind open. He's open to understand. I mean, if I want to go back in the ring, which I don't, you know. <laughs> It's you go to people that are good at it and listen to them, you know, be open to listen to them. But if we're going to be showing you how to disappear out of a bad situation where three people have grabbed you and you're just trying to run away to get to your car before they can get to you. Um, I'm not the person to teach you how to run, but I can teach you how to get away. OK, uh, I, my car has to be close or I'm not going to make it. Uh, Running in, not my specialty. This is not built for speed. Uh. Man, when his knees are broke, no, 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 to be, no need to be fast. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, see, that's the other thing. That's when it's looking around going, is there a camera? Uh, is, actually, it was funny. I had one incident. Wow, it's got to be like almost 10 years ago. But something was about to go down, and I just turned to the person next to me. It's like, turn your camera on i want proof that i'm yelling at this person to back away to, to, to not do what they're about to do uh you know i wanted it on camera because i wasn't gonna just waste the person they were drunk and i just was gonna try to control it but i wanted proof of what was going down i was like put your camera on you, you call 911 you turn on the camera 911 is our police number here uh so yeah i mean it, it, it's it's it, it's a weird situation where martial artists that teach self-defense, you know, let to use them. 
Yeah, in a system that doesn't want us to use it. Exactly. And statistically, we have less to use it than years before because the more the time goes by, the less the crime is high. The, the statistics are going low and low and the violent crime are going lower and lower. So just the fact to know that you can use it give you the confidence to often, you know, get out of this situation yep. even without without any punch, without any... Because you just stay calm and in control of yourself. You can take out in many, uh, many uh, bad situations, yeah. it, it, in my opinion. That. Well, it, it's a focus. It's an awareness mm -hmm. that we all get to after a while and know this is not right. Dangers on that side, spa the open spaces exactly. on this side. Let's get out of here. And I mean, you guys are above the line of craziness, but you know, we got people shooting everybody down here all the time now, you know. And <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we didn't see, <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> and, and, and see, here's the thing the weird part is like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not anti gun, I'm anti stupidity. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, we need to do something, but for now, it's like, it's like, okay. You got to know the difference between cover and concealment. It's great. You're hiding, but if it's behind a wooden door, that doesn't stop bullets. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and it's sad. We have to teach this now, but it's like, no, how do you do this? How do you deal with this? How do you track somebody that's tracking others so that you're constantly staying behind them and looking for that opening to get away? These are awareness things that we have conversations about because we got to deal with it, you know? It's funny because on a simple base of self-defense, uh, I saw a Montreal police uh, training video that was telling to the, the officers in training, they were telling them um, a knife is more dangerous than a gun because by the time you shoot the guy down, he's going to be to you with the knife, right? So even you have to be like a sharpshooter to take him down in one shot and it's not it's not true that a cop that uh, will be a sharpshooter all cops are not sharpshooter so he's going to shoot him and the other guy will be on him with his knife killing him right so a knife is more dangerous than a gun it can be because yeah. it, it 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 makes more damage a blade it can be that long a, a bullet is that that big yeah Right. Yeah, but not, then you never miss ammo. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I, that, exactly. You're, you're not out, right? right. Um, yeah, I mean, it, mm. it's all these things that those things are not about winning a fight, not our, our competition. Now we're talking about survival. That's our world. You know, that's what we're still trying to keep people in. I, and again, I'm pro the sports versions. Go have at it. You know. I enjoyed it when I was younger. I I did a little bit with my son. You know, he's like, he's a boxer and he wants to box with me. And about 45 seconds in, I just dropped him. He's like, what did you do that for? I said, I was going to have a heart attack if I went to a minute. I'm getting too old for this crap. You're going to kill me with a heart attack. So I can go, you know, it's like, I don't want to go for three, three minute rounds. I'm done. You're on the ground. I'm done. Uh, so... But we're talking about survival, not not game, not sports. And again, there's nothing wrong with those games. And I don't want people to get offended. The tools they're learning are usable tools, but they got to understand. But it's not the same usage because that sports person is following the same set of rules they are. There's this set of honorable rules that we're competing within these boundaries. And the person in that self-defense situation has no boundaries. They have decided how much violence. That person has already made the decision how much violence they're going to do. And we got to figure out whether we have to escape, deter, or defeat them and completely control them. And each one of those gets harder and harder. You know, you get away from them. And then you got to be dangerous enough so they don't want to do it. Or then you got to be able to control them. And that's, that gets hard, you know. That's why we do this all for years. I think it's a really good like Ending closure yeah. for the podcast. Yeah. yeah. And I know you're coming to Quebec in a few weeks. Yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna announce it in the intro. So this is why I'm closing like this. That. This is perfect <laughs> as a closure. 
but we're going to announce it. This is the purpose of your of you coming talk to us tonight to be like a big trailer of your seminar. Nice. And uh, I I hope it will be uh, interesting for people to listen. I found Very it interesting. I found it really Same. interesting. Well, thank yeah. you. I really enjoyed it. You guys uh, uh, I really appreciate your attitude about martial arts. You're very open, you know, keep a big picture. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.